Steve Bronstein, who has already been introduced, one of uh, just a really phenomenal radiation oncologist, is up first to talk about radiation modalities and strategies for CNS Mets. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Nancy Ann. I'm delighted uh, to be able to speak to everyone now about uh, radiation modalities and strategies for uh, metastatic disease in the CNS. <clears throat> I have no relevant disclosures. And I'll start by just really thinking about the scope um, of, of the, the situation, which is that brain metastases are a very common, in fact, the most common intracranial malignancies, certainly as compared to primary CNS tumors. Uh, they occur in high incidence in metastatic cancer, up to 40%, um, and associated with significant uh, level of morbidity uh, and mortality. And you can see that here uh, in this population-based study. There's variation as a function of uh, histologic subtype, uh, but this is something that's uh, common uh, throughout uh, most solid and some uh, liquid uh, malignancies. So historically, uh, radiation therapy has demonstrated efficacy with uh, simple field designs as uh, shown here, being able to treat the entire brain parenchyma um, with uh, uh, two, essentially two beams. Um, but when we jump ahead into the modern era, we see more sophisticated uh, approaches. And, and uh, the, the strength in some ways of uh, radiotherapy is that as a local control modality, radiation can access essentially all anatomic substructures and compartments. Um, it's it's it not limited uh, by eloquent location or the presence of a blood-brain barrier, which may be uh, issues uh, with regard to surgery and pharmacologic therapy, respectively. Of course, for these critical regions, uh, it's important to be mindful of the dose and the technique to minimize the, the risk of injury. The challenge uh, that we face uh, as an interdisciplinary team is that we see a diverse spectrum of patient presentations with brain metastases, and it really behooves us to consider a patient-centered I would say precision-based approach uh, to treating um, patients. And so there are those that present with a single or solitary brain lesion, those that may have multiple lesions, and those that have a frank disseminated disease, miliary disease, or leptomeningeal disease. Now, uh, comprehensive whole brain radiation techniques, which have been used historically, they're certainly not well served for individuals with limited burden of intracranial metastatic disease as the toxicity of whole brain radiation is very well established. And just to enumerate uh, some of those uh, severe toxicities includes leukoencephalopathy, the presence of microbleeds, diminished neurogenesis, cognitive impairment, um, importantly diminished uh, patient reported uh, quality of life, potential for toximity uh, or, or toxicity with a systemic therapy, um, the, the presence of over-treatment uh, because you're treating much uninvolved tissue, and limit, limiting further salvage um, approaches uh, in the presence of uh, recurrent disease. And this is really of, of critical importance uh, in the modern treatment era, um, because even with aggressive histology, such as melanoma shown here, uh, treated from, these are patients with uh, brain metastases with, for melanoma, um, treated on the left from 1985 to 2005, and then transitioning to 2006 to 2015, in a large multi-institutional study, I'm um, just describing the uh, overall survival outcomes. And you can see how those shifts, uh, those curves have shifted uh, to the right um, over time. And we're realizing these improved uh, survival outcomes largely as a consequence of improved targeted and immunotherapies uh, for melanoma. Um, but this really has uh, significance. Um, looking now at um, EGFR amplified lung cancer, what was previously 12 to six or uh, six to 12 months overall survival, patients are living upwards of four years um, due to improvement in surveillance and treatment. And so patients can bear the extended burden of radiation-related uh, toxicity with significant decrement in neurocognition and quality of life when we're treating comprehensively. So it's important to consider both disease control as well as treatment-related uh, toxicity. And radiosurgery, uh, using radiation uh, to perform ultrafocal treatments um, of just uh, the lesions involved, um, as compared to whole brain radiation, um, has a demonstrated effective local control uh, at, with high level evidence for patients with limited burden of uh, intracranial disease, one to three metastases, one to four metastases, as well as in the post-operative setting. And studies have demonstrated improved preservation of neurocognition with radiosurgery. Um, though there may be increased risk of distant brain failure with such a techniques, but um, ultimately uh, you're able to uh, preserve cognitive outcomes as compared to whole brain radiation. So, while these data support radiosurgery for patients with limited complement of brain metastases, how do we address a greater burden of disease? Well, we're catching up in some ways in our understanding of biology of radiation-related injury, shown here in, in a small animal study. 
uh, radiation uh, that was given to neural precursor cells um, in the dendrite gyrus in, in uh, mice, uh, the behavior was uh, tested. And you can see that in those patients um, who received radiation, uh, there was a diminished uh, neurogenesis, diminished uh, presence of neural stem cells, uh, specifically in the hippocampus, and uh, associated with diminished performance. Now, uh, other studies, um, dosimetric studies have been performed. This is a very nice um, uh, NTCP model from Drum Hopkins, and that shows decline in, in um, some domains of, of neurocognition following radiation as a function of dose to the hippocampi. So with, with this information, um, we have come together as a community and thought about uh, opportunities, opportunities to still provide comprehensive radiation to the brain when indicated um, but think about some of the more radiation sensitive eloquent structures in the brain. And so thus uh, emerged this notion of hippocampal avoidance uh, for patients with large volume disease um, in the brain without direct involvement of the hippocampus by disease. Now, after some early feasibility and dosimetric studies, we've ar arrived at a phase two uh, trial, a single arm that was very fast accruing uh, by Abhinay Gandhi uh, et al. Um, and uh, by performing those symmetry to limit dose to the hippocampus, uh, there was an observation um, that in some domains, we could see um, preservation of cognitive function um, to a greater degree than patients who were getting treated through the hippocampus. Um, that led, um, uh, uh, well, th that uh, resulted in um, significantly less um, uh, cognitive impairment as compared to historical controls. And also um, concerns about undertreating the hippocampal region uh, were shown to be um, overstated as only a small fraction of patients actually had progression at some point um, within uh, the hippocampus. So uh, beyond the hippocampal avoidance, uh, there's uh, other studies performed looking at uh, pharmacologic interventions to mitigate radiation-related neurocognitive impairment. Uh, and uh, patients uh, in this study were treated with memantine, um, shown to have better cognitive function following whole brain radi radiation therapy. And specifically, memantine reduced the rates of decline in memory, uh, executive function and processing see, uh, speed, as well as delayed time to cognitive decline. So taking uh, those uh, two studies and synthesizing them, uh, we arrived at the NRG CC001, which was looking at uh, both memantine and hippocampal avoidance whole brain radiation in patients um, with, again, larger volume brain um, lesions. Uh, and, uh, the results of that study, um, as presented by Abhinay Gandhi and, and unpublished in JCO, uh, Paul Brown and others um, last year, uh, demonstrated that uh, there was about a 25% relative reduction in cognitive toxicity with the combination of both uh, hippocampal uh, avoidance and uh, um, amantine. Uh, this wasn't across all cognitive domains, um, but uh, unlike the prior studies, uh, there were trends um, towards improvement, although not all statistically significant. Um, that uh, demonstrated uh, improvement in cognition. Now of note, some of these studies um, are hampered by uh, uh, patient uh, uh, fall off um, over time um, due to the uh, morbidity and mortality associated um, with the disease. Um, but nonetheless, we do see very uh, encouraging uh, trends and in some cases significance in terms of cognitive preservation with this technique. And uh, additional statistical modeling was able to uh, further support that, um, that hippocampal avoidance was preserving learning and memory domains over time. So let's go back to radio surgery, though. Um, for, for those patients that are presenting in the clinic, um, they may not have one, two, uh, three metastases, um, but they don't have uh, two or three dozen metastases in the brain. There are other studies um, that support the notion that we can extend our reach in radio surgery um, to provide excellent outcomes. Um, here's a study uh, by uh, uh, the Yamamoto group uh, that looked prospectively um, at patients um, with either one brain lesion, two to four as a stratification or five to 10 lesions, um, monitoring uh, outcomes over time. And what this demonstrates, there's no difference in overall survival for patients with two to four versus uh, five to 10 uh, brain metastases. Now of note, and this has been known historically, patients who have a single or solitary lesion, uh, brain lesion, um, they do see a benefit in terms of overall survival by addressing um, that lesion as compared to patients with a bigger burden of disease. In some ways, um, a solitary single metastasis uh, may be considered you know, the original oligometastatic state. Um, but uh, with regard to radiosurgery, um, these types of uh, studies that have emerged 
looking at uh, treatment and other uh, 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 studies showing that um, in uh, up to 15 brain metastases, similarly, uh, we see um, excellent overall survival. Um, uh, and it is true, higher rates of distant brain failure because of the presence of uh, microscopic uh, disease um, that is not otherwise treated by focal radiosurgery approaches. So um, along this line of, of um, study, there are a number of groups have um, been uh, performing randomized trials examining whole brain radiation versus stereotactic radiosurgery in the treatment of patients with now up to 20 brain metastases. And this is a study recently presented uh, by Jing Li at uh, the MD Anderson group. Uh, and this trial enrolled 72 patients, uh, ultimately closed due to a slow accrual, but that in part was impacted by practice uh, uh, pattern changes over time because in practice, many radiation oncologists um, uh, have embraced the notion of being able to treat effectively 15 or 20 um, brain metastases with the idea being that if there is distant brain failure, that can be salvaged. Well, this study um, uh, had a primary outcome of uh, neurocognitive function. And the results of that as presented uh, demonstrated uh, statistically significant um, uh, preservation uh, in the Hopkins ver verbal learning test, total recall at four months um, for radio surgery as compared to whole brain radiation. Now this wasn't hippocampal avoidance whole brain, this was just whole brain radiation therapy, though patients were encouraged to take memantine um, where eligible. And there was no difference in local control um, between arms um, over this very brief uh, median follow-up time. When we look at uh, the hippocampal sparing um, afforded by radio surgery in patients with greater than 10 nets, uh, and this was uh, uh, done by uh, a group up in uh, Sunnybrook as well uh, as uh, here at UCSF, um, irrespective of even having a lesion present in the hippocampus, you can treat that with radio surgery, you'll still get more uh, uh, significant sparing um, of the hippocampus. And so radio surgery, um, essentially under almost every circumstance, um, will afford you better dosimetry to the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus isn't the end all and be all uh, in terms of uh, eloquent uh, uh, cognitive um, subanatomy. Um, other groups have found um, other connections between various uh, regional domains of uh, brain and function, um, but this still uh, sends a very clear message that uh, improved sparing of non-involved structures will lead to better cognitive outcomes. And so this is leading to uh, uh, studies like this. Um, uh, there are a number of these, uh, including uh, uh, available at MD Anderson, Sunnybrook in the Netherlands. Um, now comparing uh, what might be the, the new standard of care for whole brain radiation, um, hippocampal avoidance radiation plus memantine um, versus radio surgery, looking at a five to 15 metastases. Um, with uh, outcomes of overall survival, but also uh, neurocognitive progression-free survival. So uh, this really captures what I think are the, the two key points of focusing on um, survival and control outcomes, but also neurocognitive uh, outcomes and quality of life. Now, I, I wanna switch gears uh, briefly uh, and just talk about other radiation modalities. Uh, and so as patients are living longer, we're also uh, seeing that patients um, are at risk for recurrence. Um, either local recurrence or distant recurrence in the brain. Um, and in patients that uh, are undergoing serial uh, procedures, whether they be surgery or radiation over time, um, we can accrue potential toxicity. So there are modalities such as brachytherapy um, for patients who are undergoing resection of new or progressive lesions um, that affords the ability to uh, provide an adjuvant radiation therapy with very, very uh, tight dosimetry um, using either iodine-125 or cesium-131. Uh, and uh, in these patients, our experience here is published by my colleague, Dr. Raleigh, who will be speaking uh, later today in the symposium. Uh, we see uh, in very, very respectable levels of um, local control um, with minimal toxicity um, in these patients. And our experience, as well as experience from Barrows and Cornell, um, are all supporting uh, uh, this type of, of therapy. I also wanna uh, make note, um, as we saw in uh, high-grade glioma, um, there may be a role for tumor-treating fields. Um, with a slightly modified uh, uh, technical administration. Um, so tumor treating fields, which may disrupt tumor cell growth um, by uh, impairing the mitotic uh, spindle uh, function, that can be um, uh, used uh, potentially in combination with radiosurgery or other brain radiation procedures uh, to improve local and distant control. Another um, exciting emergent technology I wanna very briefly touch on is the notion of something called flash radiation. So this is shown uh, now in a preclinical model. Uh, what flash is, it's ultra high dose rate. So about a thousand fold higher than what's given conventionally uh, in current machines throughout the country. It requires specialized delivery, um, but for reasons that are being 
uh, investigated highly, uh, somewhat unclear. Uh, it appears as though giving the radiation a very high dose rate may be able to spare um, a cognitive function uh, uh, in, in these uh, preclinical uh, animal models. So it's a very encouraging area. And the last thing that I want to comment upon, and my colleagues will uh, delve into this a uh, little deeper, is that we exist in this age where we have newer pharmacologic therapies that now cross the blood-brain barrier, um, not across all histologic subtypes, but uh, with an increasing uh, uh, variety. And so um, some of the initial studies um, in lung um, have uh, examined uh, patients receiving these types of targeted therapies against uh, EGFR um, or ALK mutations that are demonstrating patients with a burden of disease, intracranial disease, um, that there may be improved outcomes in terms of specifically uh, survival and brain control. Um, and we're seeing that more and more. Um, this is a study by Nancy Lin um, at the Farber for uh, the agents at Ticatinib, and we're seeing in patients with a background of brain metastatic disease that there is efficacy um, of these agents uh, in treating the disease um, intracranially. Now, what's interesting as a radiation oncologist is to think about how we need to partner with our colleagues in neuro-oncology and medical oncology um, to provide the best outcomes. And so where radiation, stereotactic radiation can be used very effectively for local, local control, we can also uh, afford a significant distant brain control potentially with these therapies. And that was shown here in this retrospective study from Washington University, brain metastasis treating for melanoma in the setting of radio surgery, the addition of a checkpoint inhibitor therapy reduced rates of distant failure as compared to radio surgery alone. Um, and so there's a number of agents um, that are now becoming more commonplace. Um, and we're seeing intracranial um, response rates that are upwards of 50% in these recent trials. So in summary, um, patients are living longer with metastatic disease um, intracranially. Uh, as a community, um, in this interdisciplinary community, we need to focus both on local control and treatment-related toxicity and quality of life. Um, radio surgery as a modality has demonstrated excellent local control and neurocognitive functional outcomes. In some instances though, the, the newer modified whole brain techniques may be appropriate, especially in patients with advanced disease. Um, there are a number of uh, salvage uh, techniques that are being explored, including uh, repeat radio surgery and brachytherapy in patient uh, select fashions. And, and really what I think is exciting for many of us is these newer CNS penetrant therapies um, that are showing increasing efficacy. And we really need to partner and design thoughtful studies around the timing and sequencing of uh, radiation uh, around the use of these agents. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions in the Q&A.